I am for discipline. I am for clarity. I have invented the word la ville radieuse, which cannot be translated in English. He's usually quoted nearly everything that I have said, and not quite the way I said it. but 
also distorted and possibly emotional at the same time. It's maybe a more explicitly sentimental version of that. Um, this is a kind of a uh, this is a survey drawing of uh, the Snow Gates Runners poem, which was uh, originally drawn as supposed to be a, a postcard, which was would be published by the Irish Times, but it never crossed that stage. But we're kind of interested in it as a, as a drawing, which kind of a single drawing, which explains a uh, place, some, maybe the third way. So we're kind of interested in non perspectival drawing and orthographic projection and in distorted drawings, which allow which are a non-realistic depiction of something which will allow kind of hopefully a more full description of the thing. So this is an example of a reference drawing. Um, this is uh, Your Nutsons Can Liz, which we were uh, you know, to spend a week in last summer. And there's a kind of a <coughs> one and one things we could pick out about this building, but I think in particular there was the, the, the main courtyard which faced the sea and the kind of very structured uh, nature of the architecture on first glance, but behind that there was a kind of softness of it, which uh, was, was to do with the kind of normal stuff of life. So it's kind of like it's, uh, an idea of a soft and monumentality. There was this Giovanni Superleggera chair, which we can see as, I suppose, a refined version of the typical. Or kind of, uh, Exaggerated origin. Yes. yes. So it's kind of like almost a vernacular chair, but it's refined to the point where, at least at the time, it was the lightest production um, chair in the world. So we're kind of interested in things that are something that might kind of fit or at the level of the detail rather than at the overall level of the form. And this is the Katsura Imperial <coughs> Palace and the, the shoe removing stone where you where you approach the, the the entrance and you take off your shoes and then your shins are kind of caught by the ledge above and that makes you kneel before you go into the palace. And it's kind of an, an idea of behavioural order or something, you know, that architecture can reinforce a way of doing something and not kind of in a social engineering way, but like more to do with something that might support a reenact a positive kind of aspect of life. This is Tikal in Guatemala, it's a Mayan city, and I suppose the amazing thing about this is it's kind of Architecture as experience rather than as an object. So there's as you below the, these trees, there's kind of amazing uh, cigarettes, I suppose you call them, on the top of which the relatively small uh, temples are placed. But it's about this idea of uh, positioning yourself in a different way, which kind of transcends the normal experience of living in the jungle with a kind of much more free, expansive uh, feeling. So I think, obviously, in our own work, this would be something much less epic and would be to do with how you set up a room or how a window <coughs> changes your perspective. And this is the building I suppose we're particularly obsessed by, which is the, the uh, Morris Vinny by Sarah Fenn. So for any of you who aren't familiar with it, it's an uh, incredible idea that it was a building which would change the light, the strong light of Venice into a much softer light, which is more common in Nordic countries. And we're really interested in this because it's structure, not just a structure, but structure is almost a cultural filter, so it's almost like considered a kind of perfect structure. So it's doing a lot more than just the normal understanding of structure. So I think through this kind of process of research, it, uh, it, which is very much in its infancy, and like all these kind of icon drawings are the, the first style that we're expecting to develop over the course of the PhD. Already, things are becoming uh, uh, obvious, or we're becoming conscious of, of aspects of the practice or motivations of the practice that before we didn't know were there. So, I think before this, we might have kind of just supposed to type class ourselves simply as architects who are much interested in the, the, the uh, construction and language construction and expression of that. But I think there's, there's aspects of architecture as kind of an engaged framework for, for life, ideas of kind of contradictory motivation in the one project and ideas of balance, which I think is a particularly important thing to get a balance of those. So um, the idea going forward is that if we full, more fully understand the architectural ground which we want to work on, which we don't really say we don't really know for sure what that is at the moment, but you know with more clarity on that we can kind of go forward and pursue a more fruitful kind of practice. Okay, 
so um, sort of sticking with the theme of research, this was an early piece of research which helped us clarify the themes of our first project. It's an aperture for displaying videos and it was created for the Liza Spaces exhibition of the 2008 Venice Biennale. Um, this is just our first project. It was actually for my parents and my sister and brother-in-law <coughs> and her husband. And, you know, in reality, family are sort of the only people that are going to let you lose on the first project. So uh, what it was, was there, um, there was an original family home in to the Burns Road in Dublin and um, that was being sold and everybody was moving out. Um, so they had another house on Mohampton Road, which is an old uh, Victorian terrace house. So it's a Victorian plot that two generations of the same family was going to live on. Uh, we put a new brick house in the rear garden as a muse, even though these, because these houses actually never had muses because the tramway was installed in uh, Morehampton Road, so they didn't need stables. Um, and there are two main themes uh, in this project. Um, there's memory or ritual, and then also construction and expression. So we're going to talk about memory and ritual first, and then the construction and expression. So this is my family. Uh, so the big concern for both sets of clients after living in the same family on for 30 years was that they or the extended family wouldn't feel a connection with the new houses. So both houses were designed in conversation with the clients and the design aimed to encapsulate their remembered spaces of the original family home and to make explicit the inherent rituals of domestic space. For the Lives of Spaces exhibition, we sort of expanded those conversations through three videos. Um, the videos represented sort of past, present, and their future states of dwellings. Um, the videos were shown in an arbiter, which I'm sure uh, saw an image uh, a couple of slides ago, um, which when you looked through it, overlaid those past, present, and future films on top of each other. Um, the requirements of the brief for the armature dictated that the, uh, it should be white MDF, something as you know people interested in construction and expression uh, weren't particularly comfortable with. But and you'll see this sort of running through as we talk about things. There are sort of things that have pushed us out of our comfort zone that we think that is a really positive thing. So it, it, it basically it pushed us to explore form rather than materiality. So the, again, on this thing of um, the, the seamless fabrication of this was a challenge for us. So we had to make um, folded out drawings so that we and also the fabricator could understand. So the one on the left is the outside of the armature and on the right is the inside of the armature which holds the DVD players which play the films. Um, and this is me and my mum and dad <laughs> looking at the films. Um, in the armature, and there's a, sort of three apertures that you look through when you look directly at other types of films. And it's located in a beautiful palazzo, which immediately made me realise why they wanted these sort of white, pure forms as a, as a sort of a contrast against the rich palazzo that was around it. Um, so that piece helped us clarify the relationship between the remembered sp spaces and the new. It helped us define our interest in memory and ritual. So on the left here is a photo of the staircase in the original family home in Burlington Road. And uh, <coughs> the staircase was a, my sister remembered the staircase as a room. It was somewhere you could play, or you could sit, or you could talk on the phone. So in her house, we expanded the staircase to fill the room and created places to play and talk. Um, the living room of the house in Burlington Road um, was, remember, it was a very social place, with a fireplace, a hearth, with the, which was the centre point. So again, in her house, um, we placed it at two hearths, one for cooking and one for gathering around for warmth, at the centre of the open plant ground floor. Cooking was also remembered as a social activity, so these hearths were placed in relation to each other to act as the social focus of the house. The ritual of the Sunday dinner, which I think is something that most people will be familiar with, and it was Sort of, it was something that we really did every week. And uh, that the, there was a large dining room in um, the old house which had a table big enough to sit, about six brothers and sisters, and then plus partners, and then we could get a bit cramped. So um, in the new dining room, which was the only new space, new space we made in the uh, main house on that Victorian plot, 
uh, we made this dining space and we placed a sort of almost altar-like table in the middle of it. Um, and it, it's a concrete table and it's immovable and it's rooted in the building and ties the family to the new house. So, constructional expression. So the ideas of memory persisted through to the construction methods of the new house as well. We're interested in the expression of construction as a means of communication, a way of embodying the culture. Um, we think of the muse as the younger brother of the main house. So the muse is on the left and the Victorian house is on the right. Um, so the Victorian house was um, made of sort of monolithic um, Flemish bond wall, which is a one brick thick solid wall construction. And we were looking at the sort of modern constructions, which are layered constructions, which sort of makes this, you know, hypothetically makes the solid wall um, construction redundant. So what we did was we um, separated out the Flemish bond and then we placed the muse house between these two separated leaves. So on the left you can see that, um, that one of the leaves is, you're left with the uh, <coughs> header bonds, sorry, header bricks projecting and uh, on the right there you can see you're left with them. Where those bricks are missing you're left with a brick mesh. <coughs> So this is the um, front of the uh, news house, so we placed the projecting bricks on the front. Um, it's sort of interesting actually, we, we've kind of done this as a sort of theoretical type of thing and we haven't really realised how kind of strong the pattern and the shadow and the texture is going to be on the front. But you can see how dense it gets there. Um, and on the rear we placed the uh, brick mesh and uh, we used it to, to ventilate the upper rooms through it. And we also filled it in where we needed to bring um, structural forces down to the ground. So I think there was a kind of, like, uh, it's very important to us to, to try and tease the language out of how something was made. So that if like, the lens will expand further, it's deeper, and you let the little B shallower if it's expanding something it's more narrow. Uh, and you kind of accept those things rather than trying to make the lens consistent. So, I suppose that was kind of throughout this muse house piece was really trying to tease the language out of how some things are set up as a little bit forced to be done. Uh, that's just a detail of that lens land that the, um, the bricks filled in for the windows above the lentils. And uh, this is looking through with one of the ventilation panels open, and um, the air is sort of the air filters through the brickwork. So, you're, you're aware of this brick mesh when you're inside the house. Um, another idea about sort of memory and construction was, as Fergus mentioned, we went travelling and um, this is a the, sort of an eaves detail of a Japanese temple and we were really struck with how well that this embodied Japanese culture, it was distinctly Japanese. And so when we came home we wanted to sort of translate that to Ireland and, to, and also with this interest in layer construction to express those layers but to do it using typical Irish construction methods. So we have a projecting, the rafters project over the eaves and then there's a, a shadow made under the uh, roof finish to represent the insulation and then a very thin gutter detail which um, is sort of about the slates. And if you can see the top right there, we um, painted the cut ends of the rafters which is a traditional Japanese way of doing things and it's, you know, it's a, it's a characteristic but it also has a, a, a pragmatic thing that, in that it protects the end grain of the exposed joists. We, there were other ideas running through the um, through the muse, especially about construction expert um, construction and expression. I'm not really going to get into them here. It was about brick bonds in the chimney, which was the central focus of the house, and the, how the bonds changed depending on how the chimney was functioning. And then a space of sorry, apologies for the crappy quality of that image. It's kind of old, and we've lost the drawing. Um, so this is a space that. Um, really embodies the themes in a kind of a pure way is that um, uh, dining space. Um, well, a, a, another theme that, that runs through is this idea of um, pattern marking ritual spaces and also um, so what we did in both the hearts that you saw in the muse and in the dining space we marked those places that we sort of saw as ritual places um, and we gave the bricklayer and the tiler just, um, we, we got this brick and this tile made and then they could place them however they liked and create their own pattern and sort of a an idea of the uh, memory of the maker. It 
it's worth saying we gave the bricks to the bricklayer and we laid them all the same way the first time. <laughs> so we had to sort of, you know, nudge him to make his own pattern. But he did in the end. Um, and so this is a view of that, that dining room in the main house. Um, and it's, uh, what we did there, we, we were interested in, in structure being the most important thing in the, ro in the room. So we twinned the joists and ran them through what is the roof right above and spanned them from a corbelled beam which um, rests on the, rear return, the original rear return over to the garden wall which we lined with this new brickwork. So an observation that came after actually, weirdly, uh, seeing this built was that interplay of light with the structure. And uh, we thought that, you know, that it's a, it was a really nice way of light and structure making a space beneath and also using structure as a filter. So it really that, that little room is a microcosm of all the things. So the idea of construction expression, the idea of memory, the idea of ritual, Passion. Yeah, so it all comes into that space. It, it sets up the space which reinforces rituals of the family. It, it, it um, displays the, the mark of the maker in kind of in explicit terms, I suppose, in the brick, the brick um, pattern in the rear wall, but also it's about refinement of construction in the twin joists and the, and the fact that we decided almost blindly at that time just to send the joists through the roof light as opposed to stop and start it. Then came to this kind of observation with the interplay of, of light and structure. Which neatly leads us on to our next project, um, which is an extension to the rear of a housing plan scheme. And really, this project comes out of that dining space. So, the project was to um, strip away some existing, a couple of existing extensions that were back of, it, of this house. And the idea was to create a wall of brick with structural arched openings. Um, the extension at the back of the house actually faced north, so what we did was we turned the structure over the dining area, which leads onto the kitchen here, we sort of turned it in the long direction, or the wrong direction really, to allow east and west light in and through those joists, which comes directly out of that observation from the Mahantronology <coughs> dining room. And there was a game of um, sort of playing with the thickness, because this actually was a model, this was a one brick thickness. So they wanted to, you know, play with the game about the thickness of it. So we swapped the windows to the internal face and the external face. We included uh, structural downpipes, which are between the arches, which actually resist the thrust of the arches, but also carry water from the roofs down to the ground. So, um, the forceful expression of the arches in what was a, a fairly modest domestic extension is, you know, on reflection kind of unnecessary and was more of an intellectual idea about construction. In the end, we realised that the project was really not about the facade to the garden, but rather the tuning of interior space with a particular light in view. So this is another project, um, by necessity, this is the smallest and cheapest project because this was actually our own house. Um, it's a two up, two down workers' cottage uh, just off Pier Street. Um, so you can see from the plan there how dense that little block is. You know, there's very little open space. And the typical situation in one of these houses is to create sort of an introverted yard, regardless of whether you're at the centre of the terrace or at the end. And our house is obviously out on the red it's at the end. So we wanted to make an extension which reacted to this specific end of terrace condition. We wanted to get a kind of critique of the, these types of extensions. So the original part of the house was left as it is because we had no money. Um, and the new extension turns itself towards the street um, and towards the light, it must be said, because that wall sort of faces um, southeast. Um, so you can see uh, in this plan, uh, this is the original house, um, I should really have a pointer. Um, there's a small little yard um, facing along the pavement here, and then a new kitchen and tiny little bathroom at the back. So it aims to be both open and protected at the same time. So this is the typical condition on the right and on the left. I don't break this now. Um, on the right is the typical condition, uh, which is all about protection and all about privacy. Where, and on the left is our new house, which tries to be sort of private and open at the same time. So this is um, 
just an idea of the, the sort of tectonic of that thing. It's a the facade acts like a deep open beam, and then the roof rests on top of it, and then there's a, a sort of brick garden wall placed in front of it. So this section probably shows it a little bit better, and it's about sort of a layering. And uh, so you have the perforated brick wall, which is worth saying the perforations are only at low level, so that um, people on the street aren't looking in. Uh, but when you sit down at the table, you can look out. Um, with, then you get a narrow yard and then an open sort of high facade, which when you're inside, you just get a view of the sky. But at night, a lot of light spills out of there um, onto the pavement. So it's sort of, it's permits protection, but it also is about <coughs> openness. So the interior on the left is that kitchen space, looking quite messy, actually. Um, and the structure, in the, 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 this sort of deep beam with the fins in it, it also sort of catches that south light and bounces it back into the space, because actually the house is quite dark, because the front faces south, but that's directly onto the street. So on the right, you can see our solution to that, which is to sort of rip off um, rip off barrier a little bit and um, do these sort of split shutters that allow them to be closed for privacy so people can't view in and open at the top to get light in. They're also mirrored to further bounce the light. So uh, in reality the, the, the structure that you know holds up the roof that becomes a, a framework for inhabitation. It gets used rather than just it, it again ties back into this thing of structure it's not just there things up, you know, it can be used. Yeah. It, it, it does several things at once, um, you know, obviously it, it, it performs a structural role, but it's, it's then manipulated to uh, perform the role of, of, of bouncing light, of screening it, of becoming a framework for that, just the normal day-to-day -day things, so I kind of, I suppose it's, it's a bit representative of, of our, I suppose, our approach towards structure and destruction. Um, this is kind of <coughs> the next two projects are kind of on a similar theme to that. Um, this is for the RHA exhibition, um, and this is the model made by Ivan McConnell out of uh, birch plywood. And it's really it's a hypothetical project, which is is a is a kind of a combination of two projects that we were working on in the office together. But essentially, it's kind of a it's a it's a it's an imagined thing. It's an imagined thing, which is uh, about how structure and light can begin to define space. And this was part of a, a wider group show um, with a uh, group of architects who we kind of shared the sensibility with. From the, from the left there, it's Hansi Moore, and Taka, and Little Brian Kinnahan, and Burke uh, Williams Egan, and on the right hand side, Steve Larkin. So it was kind of really interesting for us to show as this next project is a house that's not built yet, but we <coughs> still hope to build it. Um, it's uh, it's a, a rural house in Cork, um, and it's kind of the project's about making a place in a wider landscape. It's kind of an unusual situation where the, we find gave the choice of many acres of farmland to choose from. Um, lots of amazing sites and all this kind of stuff, but we, we kind of gravitated to <coughs> the, the one place which actually has a building on it. It might be because we're on something we can't handle building from far away from buildings. But uh, there was a the, the, the spot we chose was a there was a ruined uh, farmhouse, um, and it just I'm, I mean I'm not sure but it's, maybe it's it was because of the logic of someone had actually kind of. There was distinctively placed a house Shows there. In that place yeah. that, that was a right, it seemed like a right place, but or, I'm not sure whether it was because the house was already there. But essentially, the, 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 the project is a, is a pair of mon monarchist volumes, um, right angles to each other, is, that is, which kind of hold a, a, a garden space between the, uh, the ruins and the same house. So, this is a, a 25 sectional model through the through the one of the monofish volumes um, made by Hugo. It's worth saying we asked Hugo to make a spatial model out of cars, what we got was yeah. <laughs> a crazy construction model, which is amazing and, and brilliant and really added to our understanding of this project. So again, the, the, so 
So the base bed is that the roofs pitch towards uh, the sun, so in the living spaces they pitch towards the south, and in the uh, bedroom block they pitch towards the east and the rising sun. So it was kind of, we were thinking about what is the nature of a, a house in the country these days, you know, that previously, like the other house, kind of backed into a hill, the ruins, um, it was more about an idea of protection from, from the elements, but you know, nowadays it's more about something that, that might stretch to the conqueror, stretch to bring in the elements. So in the interior shot, the, the tall side of the monopitch has a kind of continuous clear story which admits light in between these uh, solid triangular uh, beams and fins. And then below that, there, below that level there is a series of more traditional kind of, I suppose, hole in the wall openings. So you kind of get a combination of a, a, a more familiar sense of enclosure with kind of, this kind of addition of light from above. Um, and this is the plan here. <coughs> Obviously you can see the ruins there on the left and the new building on the right hand side which holds a uh, garden space in the centre. Um, this kind of landscape design which is kind of, kind of amazing as well. But I think it's interesting to see the, the, I suppose the intuitive logic of the, of the ruins um, <coughs> in comp which we kind of were permitting an idea about inhabiting a convention. Uh, the intuitive kind of logic of those versus the kind of more formal logic of the, the buildings which are orientated to, to the cardinal points and which are about kind of accepting, accepting the elements. Um, this is a very different context. This is for uh, a house in Fur House, a new built house to put in the side garden of, of an existing house. Um, and so Fur House was a kind of, of semi mature suburban estate. And it's, this was a really, really interesting context for us because it was, kind of, I suppose, it's suburbia and the you know, majority of uh, Dublin's neighbourhood is kind of context. But also we kind of thought it's, it's an extremely coherent context in an architectural sense because you know virtually every house is, is the same. So it was kind of how do you how do you add to that, I suppose. And I suppose for other reasons it was uh, a very interesting context. This is the kind of stage I grew up in and the house is for a very old friend of mine and my mum and everyone I grew up with lives around. Pressure. So, uh, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, so we were thinking about how do we but it's, it's also about if you work to NASA, It's also about place making in a you know in a similar way to Drum Lee, but in an obviously very different context. The 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 corner site actually was uh, beside a cul-de-sac, which was very underused used and not really a place people spent any time in. So one of the requirements of the client, I think, for James was that we could somehow you know uh, address this cul-de-sac and. and Reappropriated for the rest of the estate and for people to feel comfortable to be in. So, this is kind of a drawing based on a historical map, but I suppose it represents the situation up until the late 1970s. So, you know, to a rural context, the buildings you can see there are not like Castle and there are a few kind of farm buildings. And then, pretty much all of a sudden, in a, in a way, like the, the housing estates were built in the late 1970s. Um, which in a way kind of uh, swamped the, the, uh, the castle <coughs> and was the M50 you can see in the top right the corner. So kind of thinking about this and seeing Knockland Castle kind of in this context, it kind of felt a little bit to us like, a, like an erratic in the landscape in the sense that it was made with the same stuff as the, the state houses, so it was like pebble ash and pitched roofs and stuff like that. But, but it was, in a way, it was different. So it was the same and different. So that's kind of how we were thinking about this new building that we'd be putting in there because it wasn't part of the context, but it had to fit in some way because it wasn't laid down at the same time. So, so this the, the house, in, as it sits in the context, so it's made of the same stuff as the estate. It's made of uh, uh, wet dash, wet dash walls, and concrete tile pitched roof. And it forms the end of a row of houses, and uh, we were, you know, as I was saying, we were kind of very interested in it, in it, it somehow turning a corner. So, uh, in this condition, normally in the suburban estate, you get the sidewall of the house, and that would be it. So, the houses are kind of 
they're the same house, they're laid down regardless of orientation or their immediate context. So in a way it was, was kind of a, 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 a critique, but we wanted to set, it was a way of showing the difference in this house. And the materiality of it is kind of like a, a raw version of the estate houses, so somewhere between the castle and the, the estate houses. So it's, um, larger aggregate wet dash which is left unpainted to weather naturally so you know unlike the surrounding houses where the, the pebble dash is painted the, that, that is I suppose quite a fragile finish on, on a house and will weather quite awkwardly whereas we feel that the, the unpainted pebble dash has a, has a depth to it. Yeah the grimier it gets the better it's going to look because you get shattered and get more texture. Pebbles fall off and stuff it's painted the unpainted stuff has a, a sense of depth to it. And the, the entrance um, with a half door is kind of a memory of the rural context um, which the site once sought. And then just very briefly the, the plan form is kind of generated from directly from uh, the plan is kind of generated from building lines so the, the, the front and back building lines and the adjacent buildings and uh, the skewed line of, a, of an offset from a, uh, an underground sewer, so there was a kind of a planning requirement that we stayed three metres away from this. Um, and then this is the first floor plan. The reason I'm showing this first is because this kind of set out the building because it's, it's quite a compact footprint, a bit smaller than the typical um, so estate like house. It's 90 square metres, I think, in or around. Both floors. Which is small for a three bedroom. Um, so the, there was a requirement to have three bedrooms upstairs and a, and a bathroom. So the only way to do this was to for the stairs to arrive at the centre of the plan. So this is kind of we have a central chamber which then opens out onto the four rooms, and then downstairs this kind of central stairs uh, does the job of kind of I suppose loosely delineating what is otherwise an open plan. And the, so the character of the building comes very much from the details. Uh, the window detail is really kind of a window axis, so, so it was about um, a raw expression. So we suppressed the window sills, so they're kind of like shallow troughs with a spout, and we suppressed the window frames by putting them behind the external structure. So the, the, the building is made up of a, um, an external carpet or masonry wall, which is lined internally. And this idea of lining kind of informed how we thought about the the space is internally, so at the ground floor it's lined in birch by fitted furniture around the edges and it's quite an expressive space in the, on the ground floor which are the more kind of communal areas of the house and then upstairs we thought about the, the rooms as being more abstract and more, I suppose like retreats and individual spaces in themselves. Um, and this is, this is the view of the kitchen so you can see the, the uh, the lining, the idea of lining a birch ply furniture, so it has a depth that accommodates a kitchen in one position, or shallow, shallow shelving in another, or, uh, or a window seat. And then this little section, which kind of was clearly shows this idea of lining, where upstairs we pull the lining away from the external envelope to create kind of individually roofed uh, tented spaces upstairs, which are like this. They're kind of, you know, it was a way because the, in a way they're quite awkward in plan, but this is a way of just giving a sense of completeness to the individual rooms. And this is just the rear elevation, which kind of becomes a little bit less formal. And there's a bigger window to the mountains and the, the possibility of uh, adding on an extension. So, so these um, next two projects are kind of more abstract, more. Um, conceptual things, I suppose. This is a, they're sort of one idea of projects. And uh, this is um, a house we did for a wallpaper magazine. Uh, the model was made on CNC Machine New City by Joe Swan. Um, and the brief was to create in true wallpaper style a uh, ultimate holiday retreat. So we had to, we were only allowed to present one image of this. We could do the model, the model was in an exhibition, but in terms of magazine, it was one image. So it was a tricky thing to do and it had to be very explicit about what it was. It was a, a one-trick pony, you know. 
And so we took the idea of retreat quite literally, and we uh, thought about this on the cliffs of the Aran Islands, which was, you know, the edge of Europe, edge of Ireland, edge, and then we set it right on the edge of the cliffs. Um, and we looked at obvious references like reinforce and clockings, and it's about a series of layers of retreat, and about, um, so you, you retreat to the island, then you retreat to the back of the island, which faces the Atlantic, and you then you retreat behind these walls that make a sort of place within an expansive landscape, which is both what we were talking about in from me as well. And then eventually you go to your own individual cell, which overlooks the cliffs. So, and when you go into that cell, you then have this sort of almost vertiginous view of, of, back out to the Atlantic, so you're, you're, you know, back out into the world. So, you know, I'm not sure we get planning permission for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's but, good. Yeah. But it was, it was a fun thing to do, you know. Um, another it was difficult, because... It was, it was really difficult. Because a lot of where we think the quality of what we do comes kind of interrogating details Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of an anomaly, I think, but it's a fun anomaly to do, I think. Um, and then we were also asked to design a set um, for, so this is another one of those kind of one idea projects, design a set for a play that was on in the Project Theatre. And uh, it's played by John Fossey, and it's basically about a teenage band, and it's all about teenage angst. And so within that, there's this sort of theme of dislocation. And the director wanted it to feel like we were almost, that the audience was almost a voyeur into the private world of the teenager, like you're sort of looking through a keyhole or something. So the challenge was to create this sense, but with, with no budget, within the anonymous space of a black box theatre. So there literally was no budget. We couldn't buy anything, we couldn't make anything. So in the end, actually, it was quite a simple solution. They, were, they have sort of black set curtains that they use to, to block off space and things like that. So we um, took two of these long black curtains and we set them up so one came from above and one came from below. Um, and we, it sort of created this threshold between the audience and the action. And then the curtains also hit the lighting and sound equipment which sort of helped further the belief or the deception that you were looking into a room rather than a stage set. An unintended consequence, so that's kind of a crappy photo, but we don't find good photos. Um, an unintended consequence of it was that it sort of added a cinematic quality, purely down to the fact that it looked like a widescreen film. So uh, what we really like about doing this type of stuff, and this and the kind of purple, uh, uh, wallpaper thing, is that it's sort of temporary, and it's a, and especially set design, it's temporary and it's quick, and it kind of acts, like Ian was saying, it acts sort of as a counterpoint to a lot of the work we often, which is often long, can be protracted, and is definitely agonised over. So this, like the uh, wallpaper thing, it took a lot of thought, but very little making, which is refreshing for us. Um, this is another, this is one of our newest projects, it's almost it's going through a very prolonged snagging process. Um, no, sorry. That's not <laughs> the left is what we took away to put it her extension. <laughs> the right is the new plan. It's not hugely different, but yeah, the left is nice. Um, so it's another project that we were sort of pushed out of our comfort zone in a positive way. Um, it's a Victorian villa in Ponsky, and it was converted in the 90s from bedsits back to a family home. And when they converted it, um, they, it was left with the stairs um, in that glass box that you see on the left. There. So the stairs from the entry level of the Piano Nobile down to the basement was contained in that glass box. There was no other stairs internally. So the brief was to replace this box with a new one. And um, initially, our proposals and the client's idea of what they wanted, they began from very different positions. So they wanted to replace this kind of cramped glass box with a, it had a, it's, it had a spiral stairs and it was only about 800 mil wide and it was sort of, wasn't the appropriate scale for this ginormous house. Um, so they just wanted something bigger. And they were kind of looking for a glass thin a structure with glass stairs, and it's sort of something we have difficulty with, and you know we weren't too keen on doing. We went to kind of propose yeah. it's a much more, I suppose, concrete. Than we, than we normally do is 
So it was a kind of interesting conversation because there was a position of resistance from the client and resistance from us to a certain extent. But like, we, we kind of we think it's not the right position to, 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 to kind of enforce something. You know, I think, and actually often more interesting conversations come out of uh, a position of resistance from either clients or commissioners or something like that. You know, that, that it kind of forces you to, to kind of think in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, we'd have to sit and have to complete books forever. And it's only actually outside forces that push out of it and it forces us to grow as architects, I think. So in terms of the plans that we've got, the one on the left is the uh, garden level plan and on the right is the uh, piano no layer, the upper level plan. Um, so we designed a square asymmetrical steel stairs, uh, which made sort of a grand staircase, which is appropriate at the scale of the house at the lower level, um, but left a mezzanine area at Piano Noble for enjoying the garden. I think it was important to have this room at that level of the house because, along with sort of lots of houses of this period, that living room level. Um, has a really restricted relationship with its garden. So that new mezzanine was about the garden and looking out over it. So this is the lovely drawing that Hugo made first recently. Um, and basically, just to, it's, it's very good at describing what it is, um, it's a, a freestanding steel staircase with an inverted uh, roof which acts like a hopper. That's then wrapped in a steel framed glass enclosure which is tied into the roof of the edges to give the staircase some stability. And then there are very large sliding doors at the mezzanine level which open it up to the garden. Um, in terms of the glass, obviously we had issues with it, we couldn't overlook neighbours. And uh, we we're really not keen on sandblast, sandblasted glass because it can feel quite claustrophobic because it can. I think at that scale, like that, yeah. that three metres wide by three and a half metres high, I think. Glass, quality might be slightly oppressive in, in the space like this. So we're interested in a kind of a type of glass which obscured view but allowed a kind of a sense. We gave a sense of view and emitted as much light as possible. And as Fergus kind of alluded to in the beginning there, we spent a lot of time in pulse and snugs. So we uh, decided to use reader glass, which is what you see normally in a snug door. Um, so it's um, at the upper level, it's readed on side elevations, and at the lower level, it's readed um, towards the garden. Um, yes, that's that. And then uh, the section on the right sort of explains how the roof works. So we made this sort of the roof like a, a giant hopper that then drains into the central column, which is the structural column to the staircase. And we were interested in this. Kind of this inverted roof form because we wanted the expression external to be quite taut and we also wanted the internal space to sort of project you out towards the garden so it sort of slopes up in all directions when you're in the room which you can see on the right here so the left is kind of an external view these are all sort of you know they're nice you rang in our office took these photos so they're nice photos but they, it's not finished um, on the right is the view from the mezzanine. Um, this is the reason glass on the inside um, and from the outside at garden level. And then this is the staircase. So the steel structure is made really beautifully by um, New Line Engineering. And it's a series of kind of radiated, radiating, sorry, uh, 10 mil steel fins which um, encircle a central downpipe. And then it's covered in a four mil, four mil steel plate, which uh, makes the stairs wrap them over it. So the photo on the right is actually in Newline's workshop, and uh, we really like it because we think it looks like a machine, like a turbine or anyway, an engine or something like that. And so this is a detail. It's very dirty. It's, it shouldn't look like this. <laughs> but uh, so you can see the ten mil structural steels, and then the uh, four mil steel wrapping over it to make the stairs. So the Structure works in conflict, so this, the fins on their own would work, and obviously the, the, the plate on its own would work together, they tie each other together into. I would describe it as a delicate structure, because it's kind of a weirdly delicate structure. Delicate for us. <laughs> uh, and this is a detail of the base where we made a, a concrete uh, plinth at the base and it raised up to make the first three steps and uh, to support the common stairs. Oh, sorry, on the next project. 
Okay, this is another new project which is uh, finishing up at the moment and out upon scheme, designing the house that sort of being pushed out of where we're used to being, we started being interested in steel as a material. I mean, in our first project we kind of banned steel, in that Muse house we used timber, there was no steel work, it was timber or concrete. Um, and this is a refurbishment of a sort of 1990s Muse house on Waterloo Lane and the brief is very simple convert the garage into a kitchen and rearrange the uh, internal spaces. So we thought of this as a, a series of independent elements which would each address a kind of local condition within the building. So we have a uh, steel screen replacing the garage door, uh, which maintains the privacy to the lane at the bottom, sorry, that's water lane at the bottom there, uh, which is actually a very busy little cramped lane. Um, and so there's a steel screen that replaces the garage door, um, the, maintains privacy but allows view out. There's a freestanding uh, partition in the middle of the open, open plan ground floor which organises the space a little bit. Uh, we have a new window uh, facing the rear garden which just replaces sliding doors and it, what it does is really orient the view upwards from the living spaces to uh, nearby trees. And then there's a garden shed at the back of the uh, garden which gives very practically some utility space but also forms a sort of termination or backdrop to the garden. So this is it. Um, so it's, the, it's very green at the moment. I mean, it is going to be softened. It's actually like a giant window box. It's, it's all planters. And um, it's, the, the fins allow, as you're walking, that lane's quite narrow, so as you're walking down the lane, you'll never see in. It's only as you're standing directly opposite and you actually really have to stop and look in. But it does, when you're inside the space, there's quite a lot of view out. Uh, it's saying that no other houses on this lane open onto the no. lane they're all, you know, quite hidden behind shutters and things like that. So yeah. it's kind of an unusual condition. So again, it's a little bit like the, the uh, our own house that we're showing that it's about a kind of negotiated boundary that's between the public and private realm. And that again is made from a, a 10 mil steel surround with a 6 mil folded plate, steel plate, which makes those planter boxes. So this is kind of a slightly large drawing. So the thing on the left is each, so each planter box is made out of one piece of folded steel and then made in series and then wrapped in the 10 mil steel plate. <coughs> this is a very bad photo of the interior. It shows how unfinished it is, but it just shows that on the screen inside it. And then this is a bit of a tribute to Cam, I suppose. And this is that new window um, to the living space which opens onto the garden, redirecting your view. Um, the the fixed, large fixed thing at the top redirects your view onto these lovely birch trees in the neighbor's garden. Um, but the lower sort of panels are actually about the, the client is very interested in birds and likes feeding the birds. So what we have is we've made a deep sill outside this window that he can, and then he used the hatches to open up and put the food out and then you can see the birds eating the food through the central bit of the small one. Um, this is another new favorite, don't worry, we're nearly done. <laughs> it's another newish project that actually has been done for a while and we just haven't managed to get a photograph. And it's actually a brief very si similar to our first project um, but on, a, on a, a smaller scale. So there's a refurbishment and extension to the, the uh, terraced Victorian house at the front and then a small muse house in the rear garden. The extension to the main house was about embedding and opening up the new living space to the garden. So we have a deep beam um, that spans over the whole width of the plot and then but that beam is sort of oversized so it's only I think 2.1 metres to the underside and it sort of focuses your view down to the garden. And it's sort of a reference to sort of low windows that you get in the Japanese tea houses that give you a really specific view of the landscape. Um, this is it embedded. And this is a view from the dining room to in the original rear return um, through to the new living space. This is the Muse house in the rear garden. Um, it's uh, 50 square meters, um, timber framed. Um, and there's a long, narrow plan. I think it's only about three and a half metres wide. And that was sort of a prerequisite of the brief because the client wanted to be able to maintain access through to the main house at the front. And fairly inexpensive. 
uh, especially considering that this was done under the new Part L regulations, and for small houses, they're quite sort of prohibitive because you have to have all the equipment that you need in a 300 square foot house so that's sealed and it's got heat recovery and all that jazz. Um, so there's a, there's a tall central, essentially it's very simple, there's a tall central living space which you can see on the right there, which pops up because again this is quite an overshadowed site so the, the central space pops up to catch the light on each side and it's flanked by lower bedrooms and a bathroom. And then we made, we were concerned about the fact that the living spaces were only three and a half metres wide. So we wanted them to feel like that they were the full width of the plot. So we made a, a facade that all opens up and can be inhabited. So you can use it as benches inside or you can put a table outside and, and sit it that way. Okay, um, so the last two projects um, show our non-domestic projects which we've very excited about doing on the um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the first one is, um, I'm just going to show a couple of slides, it's not really developed yet, but it, it's a project for the City Council and it's a uh, refurbishment of two arches in St. Patrick's Park, beside St. Patrick's Cathedral, into a cafe and uh, toilets. Um, so we're going to really enjoy the fact that this. This project might add something to the kind of, I suppose, life or you know, visibility of the, of, the, of the city without adding a building, you know, it's about reusing it's kind of historic building stock that's underutilized, like these are just kind of storage sheds at the moment, really. Um, so, just very briefly, this is the plan where the, the, each one of the arches is occupied um, by either the cafe or the, the you know, accessible toilets. Um, I think that the original brief for this was to kind of um, place a proprietary kiosk outside this and then put seating areas inside. But we were kind of, I think, you know, well, first of all, we don't want to put a proprietary kiosk in this context, you know, very crafted sort of situation. And also, if you go to a park to have a coffee or a tea, people kind of want to do it in, in the park and right inside. So, We've put the servery and the storing to the rear of the uh, of the arches and the kind of limited number of internal seating. But then externally, we were uh, interested in not having these tables and chairs and think about it in a different way. So we've kind of we've placed think about it as kind of civically scaled table, which is nestled under kind of um, the amazing cherry tree, which in that photo there. So it's kind of it's, it's situated under that cherry tree, which kind of creates a sense of place there. But by uh, virtue of its geometry, it's kind of something that uh, can accommodate large groups of, let's say, like tourists who go to St. Patrick's Cathedral, or a couple who's sitting across from each other, or someone sitting in the corner. So, um, in a way, this is a development of the, the table in the, in the dining room in the first project, and it's kind of something we're curious about for a while to use in, in a more public context. Uh, this is so my final, final project. This is um, Marion Cricket Club, um, which began on the site last week. So it's a new build pavilion for uh, the, the club. So the, the site is located between Anglesey Road and at the top of the slide and the River Daughter at the bottom. And you can see the, the previous clubhouse at the bottom side, which was kind of looks okay in that photo, but it was kind of a pretty dilapidated state and then it had been severely damaged. Flooding and you know, I think 2011. So, um, this is the site plan with the new pavilion on it, and essentially it's a fairly enlarged, I suppose, area of building in a not much bigger footprint than the previous one. So, it's restricted on all sides. Yeah, the brief asked us for it was the, the if you added the brief up, it was to provide maybe 30 or 40 more. 30 or 40 percent more accommodation, but when we got into designing, we realised that actually the the buildable area was restricted on all sides to almost exactly the same footprint of the previous uh, clubhouse. So we had to provide 30 percent uh, more floor area in the same floor plan size. So it's like a, there's an access road around the back, and on either side there's car parking, which is a kind of revenue you know, generated for the club. So you'll be taking it those away. This is, uh, this is a model of the clubhouse made by Gerald Rogers. It's a theme 
margin would become like a meatball. It's worth saying, yeah, Gerald's actually, Gerald's an architect, but he's also a member of the club, so he's very good and made this for us. Um, so, the, 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 I suppose the idea, we, we wanted to kind of deal with, I suppose, the archetypal idea of the pavilion, which for us was about a kind of very singular building, um, with a pitched roof, which had a colonnade which faced the pitch, which you know, was about the viewing, obviously. But it's kind of a distorted version of, um, of the archetype to deal with a specific and address specific conditions on the site and in the brief. So on the left hand side you can see we've kind of stretched it over to create an entrance portico which catches the entrance road. Because the previous the previous club you came down the entrance road and you essentially came into the back of the building, which was kind of an issue for us and we wanted to create a sense of entrance. Um, and then the, 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 the apex of the roof is pulled to the other side to accommodate a kind of seasonal professionals apartments in the roof space. It's the view from the rear where you can see the terrace for the club uh, pro and then the, the portico on the right hand side. So it's kind of seemingly a rational volume I suppose, and, but it's, it's generated out of quite a simple um, pitched volume where, where the apex is placed in the desired position and then that's applied to the outline of the of the building which is you know, a direct result of the restrictions that we mentioned before. And this is a plan of the, of the building. So again the entrance support on the left which you can either uh, go around to the viewing terrace or go directly into this lawn space which is the, the bar which is obviously orientated towards the are opened up towards the, the uh, pitch for viewing and then there's kind of three niche spaces of this so one is the smoke, one is the entrance lobby to the toilets which allows light in from the rear of the plan and the other one is the bar space. So you can see that it's actually because of this requisite for about 30 percent on space it's an incredibly dense plan this not a meter a millimeter of extra space in there. Yeah nothing can move and then to the right of the bar is the uh, tea room for the cucumber sandwiches. And then to the right of that again are the home and away changing rooms. And, uh, and our initial design made the fatal flaw of making the home and away changing rooms identical in size. <laughs> we're swiftly told that the away changing rooms need to be significantly smaller. And possibly way worse. <laughs> Yeah. 
terrace to the edge of the terrace that was kind of an informal uh, rate seating, so it was kind of a layered, layered uh, spectator's view. And then the interior space, which is disengaged from the uh, overarching roof, so the roof has the job of, of uh, creating the presence of defining the building in the, in the landscape, and then the individual roofs have the, the role of, of setting up the spaces inside. Another man special. <laughs> Master of <in> the <laughs> So this is a model, I suppose this is interesting because this model was made at the same time as we were making the, uh, the working drawings or the tender package and uh, it was made in tandem with them. So it was an unusual experience for us because it was something that where we kind of check and understand the detail as we went. So the model represents, I suppose, several phases or iterations in one thing. Before this, we kind of worked exclusively through drawings, pretty much. It's not our inability to make models. But again, the model is made in an incredible way. It's, it's assembled the way the building will be assembled and constructed. In a slightly more beautiful way than the building will be constructed. I don't think we'll have those twin studs there at the top. But that's Hugo freestyling. So, I suppose we want to finish on. Um, a couple of slides uh, of the vernacular Tibetan house, and it must seem like an extremely esoteric um, reference, but it's something we kind of came across, um, I think was alluded to it, a trip that we, uh, after we, went, we finished college, we moved to London for three years, and after that we went on a, kind of a trip for several months across uh, overland from India to Japan. And uh, I think this trip was like, genuinely extremely transformative for us. And I don't think that we would be the, the same architects we are or we think in the same way having not done this trip. You know, to be exposed to things, but also experiencing them. Yeah, I think that's the key to sort of really experience uh, the nature of different types of architecture, to be critical of it, and to be almost you're, you're, as you're going, because some of it is so far and, and so different from what you used to you become almost trying to investigate it and see because when you get faced with something like this and you ask somebody around and say why is that that way and they just say that's the way houses are built you know so it's sort of really boxy and you know he spend a lot of time trying to figure it out and I think that's where a lot of our approach to construction so it's about interrogating something and to, to try and see is there something that you can take out of it. Yeah so I suppose we <coughs> casually studied these buildings but I try to understand them a bit more. So I'll just kind of very briefly describe it from an outsider's perspective. But that's so it's up on the Tibetan plateau, so it's about four or five thousand meters up there. It's pretty harsh and warm. And it's where it's there. So so the forward house is kind of obviously compact um, and enclosed with thick walls and very small openings to keep the heat in and the cold out. The walls themselves are typically built at an inward slope and they're constructed of uh, large rocks which are always surrounded by a series of smaller rocks and this is to do with uh, avoidance of resonance in the area because it's, it's very earthquake prone. Um, there's a kind of a, there's a ritual of, of repainting the exterior every year kind of as a celebration of the mountain of the snows and it happens at a, a certain period every year and the splashes of red and blue paint are kind of way of connecting with, with the elements. Um, the openings are always surrounded by this unusual shape, which I don't know if you can make out, but it's, it's a representative of the gaze of, of a, uh, a Buddhist, a Buddhist deity. It's basically like, yeah, like a black trapezoid around every window and every door. But I suppose, as well as that kind of symbolic thing, it's surely about, uh, about avoiding glare from this kind of in the high altitude so but also in some way keeping heat around the, the very small houses. Um, and each corner of the house is kind of crowned with these uh, prayer flags which in a sense bless the house. And during the summer months um, the house is kind of crowned with a cornice of collected uh, branches and yakton which are kind of built up over the, on the roof over the course of the dry months to dry and then be used as fuel so that it began to heat over the course of the harsh winter. So I suppose that the house represents
presents to us uh, an example of how architecture can be a manifestation of the kind of particular world which it, it lives in. And it's kind of a manifestation of climate, of geography, of geology, of the available materials for construction, <coughs> kind of a reflection of the culture and the value system of the people who live in it. And it's kind of both a record of, but also an active participant in how they live their lives. And I think when we, we fully understand the impossibility of, of creating a, a vernacular, and we're, that's not really what we're, we're trying to do, we do think that this house contains the kind of spirit in which we would like to create the Thank you very much.